We are the guinea pig collective. All will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. Hey. Hey, you. You right there. Yeah, that's right. I'm talking to you. Don't look around behind you. What's going on? And welcome back. So for those of you who frequent the channel, I am trying to actually create a schedule for the releases of my videos. So if there is a particular video series that I do that you like or certain content you like to see more than others, you will know what days that the new videos will be coming out. I will be implementing this over this week and next week and it should be in full swing by next week. So on another video sometime later this week, I will be letting you know what the new schedule will actually be. But as for today, we will be talking about the Transformers comics. Now, I am not talking about the newer Dreamwave and then later on IDW comics. I am talking about what kicked it off the Marvel comics that ran from September of 1984 to March of 1985 for the original four issue release. Now, of course, this series ran for a lot longer than that. I forget offhand how many issues it ran for. It was like 89, maybe or 90 some odd issues, whatever exactly it was. It was not intended to be that long of a series. This was part of a tried and true method of promoting a brand of toys that Hasbro had pretty much perfected when they had relaunched the G.I. Joe series in 1982. What they had found that worked was doing a triple prong attack. Now, what they did is they released a comic book alongside a syndicated cartoon show. Now, obviously, what they wound up doing is they partnered up with Sunbow, and Sunbow actually made the G.I. Joe cartoon that came out almost immediately after the comic. And then, of course, they partnered those two up with the traditional means of commercial advertisement, which were, of course, television and radio ads for their toy line. This means of triple prong attack advertising Hasbro had successfully used with G.I. Joe and when they partnered up with Takara to bring the Transformers over and they remarketed them as the Transformers because they were two distinct and separate toy lines. If you would like to learn more on that, I've actually done a video on the Diaclone and the Micro Change line that the Transformers originated from and I will try to post that link at the end of this video. Hopefully I don't mess that up. So, of course, after they got into a partnership deal with the car, they decided they were going to use that same method of advertisement to promote the Transformers, and they did so to great success. Now, you will hear many people talk about when it comes to the canon of the Transformers that everybody seems to think that the cartoons from Sunbow are the de facto end-all be-all of the canon for the Transformers and that what went on in those cartoons is the only thing that matters. This could not be any more wrong. Marvel Entertainment's comic actually had started first and many of the outlines that they put into the comic carried over into the cartoon when Sunbow started it. But unfortunately, Sunbow did not follow the script when it came to the comic and they kind of ran with their own story. While roughly based off the comic, they did make a few changes that, that while fundamentally didn't change the story by much, they were minute differences that just altered it enough that it actually created almost a separate canon within the canon. Even though, once again, when you want the original canon, you have to go back to the source material, which was Marvel and which was the Marvel comic books. Because originally, Marvel actually created all the bios for the Transformers toys when they came out. Now, this was originally dropped on the desk of editor-in-chief Jim Shooter, who in turn placed it in the hands of writer-editor Denny O'Neill, who was coming off his revolutionary 1970s run on DC's Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and who made his bones at Marvel scripting and editing many of the flagship titles like Amazing Spider-Man, Daredevil, and Iron Man. Now, O'Neill chose to work on Transformers because the pay for Marvel's toy tie-in projects was usually larger than that of the standard comic book fare. 
but apparently O'Neill didn't get it, and Shooter wound up taking the project to other writers in the Marvel office, and unfortunately, none of them really wanted to do it. Now, one of the things that was a holdover from Denny O'Neill was actually the leader of the Autobots, which, of course, is Optimus Prime. Now, eventually, he wound up at Bud Budiansky's desk. Now, Bud Budiansky actually claims that he was the third or fourth person that was actually given the chance to tackle this project, and he took it since he was still trying to pretty much make a name for himself in Marvel. So this would have been Friday, November the 8th of 1983, and the project needed to be completed by Monday. And it just so happened that this happened to be the weekend right before Thanksgiving vacation. So everybody was getting ready to spend time with their families and significant others. And yeah, everybody else really just didn't want it, but he took it anyway. And in two short days, Budiansky rendered all of the Transformers biographical information, authoring those iconic tech spec profiles for what would become the first wave of Hasbro's Transformers. One thing that Jim Shooter did help develop for the upcoming Transformers comic book was an eight-page treatment that basically was the template for drafting the biographies, and it was the backstory of who the Transformers were going to be. So what I'm going to read now is actually the first paragraph of the original treatment, and nothing has been changed or altered in 30-plus years. Civil war rages on the planet Cybertron. Destruction is catastrophic and widespread, and yet no life is lost. None, at least, in the sense that we know life. For the inhabitants of Cybertron are all machines. There is no life on Cybertron save for mechanical electronic creatures. As mankind is first among the organic denizens of Earth, intelligent sentient robots are the dominant species on Cybertron. Even the planet itself is one vast mechanical construct. Perhaps there was once a real world upon which Cybertron was built on, into, under, and through until no trace of the original planet can be found. But the origin of the planet is unknown lost in antiquity. Similarly, it is unknown whether the robotic life of Cybertron was originally created by some mysterious advanced alien race in the dim distant past, or whether these strange metallic beings somehow evolved from bizarre basic life forms beyond human comprehension. What is certain is that the sentient robotic beings of Cybertron are destroying one another. So after that original take-in, you get into the story, and it's basically very similar to what you've seen in the cartoons, where the Autobots are taking off on a mission, and the Decepticons follow them. So what were some of the differences? Well, as in the cartoon shows, that they were basically leaving Cybertron to look for another source of energy, and that really wasn't the case in the original comics. Apparently... Cybertron had broken free of its orbit and was kind of hurtling through space and its current trajectory was taking it right into a giant asteroid belt. So the Autobots got in their ship and they were going to destroy this asteroid belt so Cybertron could pass safely through. Now this they wound up incorporating into the cartoon when they wound up going into the asteroid belt, but this was just another one of those things where they incorporated elements of the original comic into the cartoon and did not follow the script, but kind of altered it to try to create their own story. So, of course, after the Autobots have destroyed all the asteroids, the Decepticons attack, and it's very similar to the attack that you've seen in the cartoon. Now, the one difference is, instead of just happenstance and they crash into planet Earth, Optimus Prime actually directs the ship to crash into planet Earth, because at the time, it seems like a lifeless planet. Once again, very similar, but there are small and subtle changes. Now, one of the other subtle changes that actually happens in the beginning of the comic book is everyone on board the Ark is revived when the volcano erupts. Now, obviously, in the cartoon, a Decepticon falls down, and the Decepticon is first reactivated, and then all the Decepticons are reactivated, and Starscream shoots at the mountainside. 
thereby causing a small explosion that causes Optimus Prime to fall into the beam and he gets repaired. Now in the comics, obviously, like I said, that didn't happen. They were all just repaired at the same time once the explosion happened because the ARC's computer just repaired everybody. It didn't see friend from foe and it didn't matter. But everything else was basically the same where there was a small drone that came out and it basically surveyed all the mechanical, what it thought were life forms, and it created new alt forms for all the Cybertronians that were on the ship. One of the other differences was that spark plug with Wiki was not a oil rig man, but in the comic books, he was actually a mechanic. And since being a mechanic and knowing cars very well and how to repair them, he knew something about fuel. So the Decepticons actually wind up capturing him and hope to wring out information on how to convert Earth's fuels into something that they could use. Enter Spider-Man. Spider-Man in the black cosmic suit, or as you would know as the symbiotic suit. Now this, during the original Transformer run, was the first and only appearance of another Marvel character in the book. But as we close on to issue number four, a tremendous battle takes place where in the end the Autobots actually beat the Decepticons because, well, Sparkplug actually poisoned their fuel. <laughs> And this was where it was supposed to end at first. It was, after all, only supposed to be a four-issue limited run, but before they even got to that fourth issue, they found out that they had a small juggernaut on their hands and that this series could actually go on its own and it had legs. So they actually decided they were going to create a different ending for it and in comes Shockwave and he pretty much puts down all the Autobots and the Decepticons have won. And then it starts off with issue number five with that really classic image of Shockwave, very true to his toy form with the tagline, the Transformers are all dead. Anyway, guys, that's all I have on this one. Have you read these comics? Are you interested in them if you haven't? Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And of course, if you like what you've seen and what you've heard, go ahead and destroy that like button for me. And of course, if you are new to the channel and you've maybe heard something on here that you like, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. And I will catch you all next time. Later, y'all.